countdown. We're just, we are live. Hi, Kelly. Hi, Art. How's it going? <laughs> it's fine. Um, thanks for joining the show and thanks everybody tuning in live and those tuning on replay. My name is Art Jones. I'm the founder of The Art of Standing Out. And I am here um, on a day where we're having the inaugural show of the Sales by Design show, where we talk to sales leaders who have done amazing work and have really built a great uh, profile for themselves in the construct of, of being successful at selling enterprise class uh, products and services. Today, we're graced with uh, Kelly Lampkin, who is one of those people from NetSuite, um, going on a, almost a decade there, having done some amazing work, traveled the world as a social um, sales trainer. Um, I am honored to have her here in the square beside me. Um, and today we're talking about what I think is a pretty fascinating subject, a subject that the zeitgeist is all excited about this week because it's the Bachelorette launches. Mm. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> I, I saw Kelly last week on a show um, that was pretty interesting. It was uh, jo Joseph Fung from Uvaro. And Kelly was on a panel with several other people. But I have to tell you, although I liked everybody on the panel, Kelly was really a standout. And that's probably because she believes what I believe about. The art of selling is less about, you know, sales funnels and the metrics of um, how many people, you know, have I emailed today and more about the personal relationships that you build. It's really the humanization of the sales process. And that's really what we're, we're going to talk to Kelly about today. But we mentioned The Bachelorette at the beginning because after seeing Kelly on that show, I, of course, went to her LinkedIn page. And what did I find? Five years ago, a post <laughs> about The Bachelorette, and it offered five things that The Bachelorette can teach us about selling better. I was like, oh, my gosh, this is amazing. And I have to admit, everybody listening now, I, I know of The Bachelorette and The Bachelor. One, I didn't know it had really been on for 16 years. Two, I didn't know that it had the incredible following that it does. But to be on TV for 16 years, you've got to have a following and provide an experience that people love. So mm -hmm. not only will I get on board with what I don't know about The Bachelorette, I'll learn how The Bachelorette is metaphor for mm -hmm. selling better in the modern world. So, so Kelly, thanks for being here this afternoon. No problem. We'll, we'll convert you to Bachelor Nation today. <laughs> Bachelor Nation, here I come. Um, you know, I said that Kelly's a, a professional that's been selling for, for quite a long time, um, you know, eight, eight and a half years at NetSuite. Um, I'm really impressed with that globe trotting digital nomad social selling experience you had for, for over a year, traveling the globe, teaching NetSuite people how to, to be more human in their engagement to, to make more connection, to drive more business for the corporation. That had to be an amazing time. And I hope to get Kelly on the other show that I've launched this week that's called The Story Cafe, where we'll dive into Kelly's story about her journey from being a, a BDR to being a, an executive uh, traveling the globe for on behalf of NetSuite. Um, but that's another show. That's another day. <laughs> Today, it's all about The Bachelorette. So I'm going to play um, the, the guy with the clipboard and the interview questions. And we have right. five questions. Kelly, and these five questions are for you. Can you answer them? Even though I'm you know up for the challenge. You're up <laughs> for the challenge. Okay. Um, as a loyal member of the Bachelorette Nation, you probably have the answers to these questions. But we're wanting you to take the Bachelorette and juxtapose what happens on the Bachelorette to what happens in the field when you're in a sales situation. First question, number one, first impressions aren't everything. Very rarely so, does, well, I'll give you the first okay. yeah. I'll, give you, yeah. I'll give you a starter. Very okay. rarely does the girl or guy who gets the first impression rose actually end up winning the heart of the bachelor or bachelorette in the end. Hmm. Let's talk about that a little bit. <laughs> Yeah, so we're approaching the season premiere of the new Bachelorette season. And you know that in the first episode, there is the introductions. So everyone introduces themselves in like their creative and silly way, trying to catch their attention of the Bachelor or Bachelorette. 
And that night, the first impression rose was given out. So the first night that the bachelor or bachelorette meets like the 20 hopefuls, they give out a rose to whoever impresses them the most. That person who gets the rose sometimes wins and sometimes very often does not. So there's many, many weeks that happen between when the first rose goes out and the last rose goes out. And I think that a lot of salespeople think, um, you know, you, you can win on the first call or you can win during the sales process. But I think if you come in too strong in the first call and you think, wow, I made an amazing first impression, like I'm totally going to win this deal. It's mine. I've won it in the first call. You can uh, fall into some traps if you don't continue to build on that interaction throughout the rest of the, the season or the rest of your sales cycle. And I think the people who get a little bit too cocky or arrogant at the beginning of the sales cycle and at the beginning of the season of the show, you know, you forget them as you go towards, there's more fancier, shinier demos the customer will see and they'll forget your product as they go through it. Um, and then you maybe rest on your laurels a little bit too much. You don't stay, t stay really, you know, on top of the deal. Yeah. And, and that's so true. It makes me think of early in my career when I was learning how to co-call when it was pre-COVID days, um, the, the person that I um, was being trained by said two things. OK, all right, we're going to go to this building. And we're going to go knock on some doors. I was working at Xerox, not selling copiers, selling technology that cost five thousand dollars a pop. But um, fortunately, I got to much more sophisticated things later in my career. But Knocking on doors was a big challenge. And he said, all right, we're always going to get off the elevator and we go to the left. You always go to the left. Hmm. I said, OK, I'll do that. And I guess it was a repetition. The other hmm. thing he said that I thought was important was that when you demo, always go last. And I hmm. think that if you can navigate and put yourself in the position to go last, then you, you really eliminate the ability for someone to go after you and say, what those guys did we do 10 times better, let me show you. And and then it confuses the prospect that you thought had you, you had a great relationship with. So how you position yourself, whether you can go last or not, how you stay engaged with that customer um, through that process of demos and conversations with the competition um, is kind of how the bachelorette and the bachelor works as well. The more that person stays in connection with mm -hmm the person they're trying to get that final rose from, the better off they are. Um, let's move to question number two. This one's interesting. Now, I would think this is counterintuitive because this question is, you're not there to make friends. Hmm. <laughs> what does that mean, Kelly? So on the show, uh, you are there to win the heart of the bachelor or the bachelorette. You are in competition with 20 other hopefuls who are also there for the same mission. You often spend, you know, more time with the hopefuls than you do with the bachelor or the bachelorette, and so oftentimes, like that creates drama. But it can also create friendship. That's why it's a TV show. Um, I say you're not there to make friends because you really do have to stay focused on the deal. Uh, the the focus is the customer, and the focus is the bachelor or the bachelorette, right? When you get distracted by drama in the house, you distracted by competition and showing your demo in a very offensive way that says, "Here's why we're better than X Y Z company." and you focus a lot of your attention on why someone else is not as good, you see in the show, it really turns off the bachelor or the bachelorette when you're kind of like talking, you know, about somebody else badly, it makes you look poor. And so I think you can align to, you know, you're, you're not there to make friends, you're there to stay focused, but you're also not there to trash anybody else. So do what's appropriate to differentiate on your own core values, but don't spend a lot of time talking about your competition because it's just not um, attractive in the show and it's not how you're going to win in business either. I, I think that's that's so wise. And and it's funny, I I have another experience in my selling career that it I guess it's said, and you probably have heard this before, that when you sling mud on your competition, you happen to get dirty as well. So why do it? And And so bad mouthing your competition only makes you look bad as well. And I think that's you're not there to make friends, but you're not there to sling mud either to, to dirty somebody else to make you rise above the noise. It doesn't just pulls you down into the mud with them. Mm -hmm. um, question number three. It can all go south on hometowns. And I found this one really to be fun because this I do know about Bachelor and the Bachelorette. It can all go south on hometowns. What does that mean? So in the show, as you near the, the finals, there's typically four finalists that the bachelor or bachelor gets to meet them in their hometown, meet their parents, meet their family, meet their friends. And you could be doing really, really well. 
and then they meet your family and the family says something very surprising about you or um, very unattractive about you or they see you in your natural habitat and it, it doesn't really come off well. Um, or your family meets the bachelor or bachelorette and they're not a fan, they don't mesh well. So it goes on both ways. I think how this relates to sales is when you're selling into a committee, which in enterprise sales you often are, there's a tendency to get single threaded and to focus on the one person that you think is your coach and is your decision maker. This in this case could be, you know, the bachelor or the bachelorette focusing on, you know, one one contender. But then you forget to impress the family or the friends or the other people that have a vote in this relationship. And so I think in sales, it's really important to diversify the number of people that you reach out to and that you build relationships with, because that one person that you didn't talk to, the your future mother-in-law, right? Like if they don't like you, you're not getting married. Um, so I think that's very important to make sure that you diversify. And then additionally, when you're on the selling side, you have to make sure that if you're giving a reference or you're having your team interact with your customer, that everybody on your team that you're in your quarterbacking is aligned with the mission and the value and the objective of the customer. Because if you bring the wrong person to your sales cycle, the wrong reference, the wrong partner, then it shows poorly on you too. So it's really about prepping your team on both sides. Yeah, it's 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 so important. And it, it, when I read that part of that your blog post, I what came to mind was the old expression, your network is your net worth. Mm -hmm. And we think of that often in, you know, I should I should really be purposeful about networking and bringing the right people into my network because it'll help my business grow. The same thing applies when you're calling on a, an enterprise, um, single threaded, as you say, you think mm -hmm. you've, you've gotten the rose from your, your primary contact, but you didn't realize that there was a committee of 10 people that the economic buyer was looking to for their recommendation, not the one person you've got there. And I, I think it, it makes me think of an old uh, statistic, and I think this is probably dated now, but it's still relevant to this conversation. It's the notion that, say, six years ago, that I think the number was 78% of everyone, before they bought anything, consulted a social network, on mm. or offline. And this 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 question then is applicable to people that are selling solopreneurs, selling to one customer. Because although you think you've got that conversation and you understand uh, in your gut and your heart that this is a win, I'm going to count this one. There, 78% of those people are going to consult a social network on or offline mm -hmm. to say, what do you think of this decision? Have you heard about this or not you specifically, but what about this technology? What about this solution? What about that service? So the more you drill down and get engaged with the customer that you're selling to, to understand how they're validating the quality of your offer um, and, and what's required in the enterprise, it's a bigger question because you have more dominoes to connect to get them to fall towards you. In the smaller entrepreneurial situation where it's a solopreneur to one customer, um, you still have the same requirement. You have the same need to understand what's going on when you're not around. And um, it, it, and when you have the rapport and you built a really strong relationship, you can ask those kind of tough questions. And um, often we like to believe, we, you know, we have hope. I just hope this one's gonna close. Well, hope is not a strategy. Yeah. Ask the question. And, and you'll be better for it all. I would I would add to that too, that you can stack the deck in your favor. So on the show, it's not like they're, it's not like you're showing any random person that you know, like you get to pick which family and which friends they meet. You're not gonna have them meet like your ratchet sister. Like you're gonna have them meet someone who's gonna say good things about you, who's gonna talk you up. If you strategize and pick the right people to speak for you, then you have a much better chance. Same thing with you know how you're selling if they're going to talk to their network anyways, you might as well stack the deck with people that you know are going to say good things. So they don't have to do as much work in finding references. If you align them ahead of time and proactively, then there's a lot less risk of them finding someone who is, of course, everyone has unhappy customers. If you can introduce them to happy customers, you mitigate that risk. Mitigating risk, a big deal in all selling. Um, and it takes, it takes patience to think through the right strategy. But, um, Every, every deal requires to step back and, and think about where am I in this deal and, and eliminate hope and think pragmatically, where am I really at in this deal? And have I dotted all the I's and crossed some, the T's or 
is there the gap analysis? Where's the gap in here and how do I fix that? And if you do that, you'll, I believe, win more. You'll get the rose. <laughs> <laughs> um, on to question number four. I can't imagine them having the same connection with anyone else. This is the bachelorette saying this, or the, the bachelor trying to get the bachelorette who says, hmm, I just can't imagine anyone else having the same connection that I do. Yeah, wishful thinking. Good luck <laughs> with that, right, Kelly? <laughs> yeah, the, the, I think this aligns to your point earlier too. Like the only way that you can not be blindsided is to be very proactive and to be a little bit paranoid. Like I, my sales managers have called me like a paranoid seller. And I think that that's a compliment because it means that I am looking for all the reasons why they would say no. What are all the reasons why someone would not want to use my software or not want to choose me as their life partner or whatever? Like anticipate the objections, be ready for them. And when you start to say, there's no one else they could possibly choose. I don't imagine a world where it's not me. How could they possibly have this connection with someone else? Like that is how you feel in sales cycles. And you see the hopefuls feel this way on the show. As the audience, you see them having connections with the other, the other contestants. They only know their own relationship. You're not gonna be privy to the interactions that your customer is having with your competition. You have to assume that it is as meaningful and as, pro and, and as proactive as you are. You have to be better, but I don't think you should get complacent and assume that what you're doing, just because you're spending the most time with them, is going to be that you're going to win. I think that really paints the, the picture of how the bachelorette or the bachelor is truly a metaphor for an enterprise sale because there's 20 people vying for the attention of one person, the customer mm -hmm. in this case. Mm -hmm. And you don't know what the other 19 people are doing. You might think you know, but you really don't know unless you really do some serious due diligence. And I think being paranoid in general, we don't think that being a good thing, but in sales, when if paranoia keeps you from forecasting too early, mm -hmm. then your stock goes up because you're not upsetting the apple cart that quarter. You're, you're staying within the bounds of what you can achieve, not what you hope to achieve. And it, it makes me think of another saying, I guess I'm full of them today. And mm -hmm. this is the samurai slogan. The samurai would say, trust no one and question everything. Mm -hmm. And I think in sales, samurai, the motto is kind of harsh, but in sales, um, you know, if you if your forecast is not accurate, too many quarters in a row, mm. I don't know, might not be a good thing. So, you know, think about that. Trust no one. That trust no one really says that everyone you you implicitly think you know what's going on. Do your best to find out explicitly what they're thinking because no one buys anything from you because you've found their implied need. Mm -hmm. And um, certainly your sales manager won't buy that. Well, I forecast it because they, I thought they were gonna buy this quarter. Trust no one, question everything. Be like Kelly, be a little mm -hmm. paranoid and, and you'll, you'll put yourself in a better position um, to understand what the connections mm -hmm. are and, and get the rose from your customer. I would, I would add that you have to test the relationship too. So you have like likability, right? So you could be very likable, but if you don't test that likability and then convert it into respect, you are not going to win in the show or in your sales cycle. So it's really about if you say like, well, the customer really likes me, that's why I'm going to win. I've had managers tell me, okay, Kelly, we get it. We get that you're likable. That doesn't mean you're going to win. That means they're not going to tell you that they don't want you because they're afraid of hurting your feelings. So you not only are you not going to win, but you're not going to forecast it. You're not even gonna know when you're losing. So I think you have to find opportunities to test the relationship to convert likability into respect. And that could be you know, pushing back when they ask for something and saying, I'll give you that in exchange for something else. I'll give you the other demo when we get to talk to the CFO. And if you start to test the relationship, you get to transform likability into respect, which is how you ultimately win. I wish I had a button that I could boom. <laughs> that, that, that really is key. Um, you know, the, the, the challenger sales model from 12, 13 years ago says that you challenge your customer um, because you, you know stuff. Have you considered going left and not right? What you just described is, is challenging them again to just be honest with you, right? Mm -hmm. And, and to, to, to give them a carrot if they give you the information that you want. And um, 
it's a collaboration to co-create uh, ROI for them. So if they're really on the team, they'll want to participate with you and and not blow smoke at you or or stonewall. Um, or ghost you. Yeah, I, I like what your manager said though. It's the you test the relationship because you're not even going to know when you lost. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they like you so much, they're not even going to tell you that you lost. You'll find out when you see them at the ball game with your competitor. Exactly. Uh, they didn't call me back. They're at the ball game and box seats with my competitor. Mm -hmm. um, I can't imagine them having the same connection with anyone else. Well, imagine it. And if they do, find out why. Because it's not, all is not lost. Mm -hmm. And I think this goes to the, the last question, which is question number five. The loneliest limo ride is kind of, you know, you know that ride. I mean, the grand finale of The Bachelor and Bachelorette over 16 seasons is when somebody gets that limo ride and the final rose. But there's more to it, isn't there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But the loneliest limo ride is when you've been eliminated. So after you are, they have the rose ceremony and like everyone else gets the rose except for you, you are asked to leave, right? So um, that is a sign that you've been rejected. But I would say like, it's not all over just because you've been rejected. We've all seen episodes and seasons where the bachelor or bachelorette chooses someone, proposes to them, and then breaks up with them three months later. So this is possible for, you know, it's not really over, even when you don't get the rose, even when you don't get the, you know, you're in the limo going home, you're on the airplane going home from Bali or whatever, you can still win. Um, so I think, you know, you got to win gracefully if you get eliminated. But even if you get eliminated, it's not over till the contract is signed. So, you know, you don't want to be creepy and annoying about it. But I do think that it is reasonable for you to persist in a respectful and appropriate way until the it really is over, until they really are married, right? Like until, <laughs> until the, that's, I mean, with our contracts, like it's like getting into a marriage after you've been doing the kind of sales that I'm doing, which is very, you know, enterprise level. So even if they say, you know, we're going with someone else, well, have you already gone with someone else? If you haven't, then there's still a chance. And I think you should respectfully and appropriately find the way to still, you know, assert your value. Absolutely. Um you know, and I think these five questions have, if there's a common thread, it goes to the emotional intelligence of the rep. And EQ, we talk a lot about it in, in business. We, we talk, we've been talking about empathy like crazy since COVID hit because we really are thinking about caring for each other more than we have in a long time. But emotional intelligence is really um, kind of the, the thread that runs through the five questions that we've we've answered here uh, as metaphor using the bachelor and bachelorette as metaphor for, for selling. And I know on that show that I saw you with, uh, with Joseph Fung, you, you talked a bit about empathy um, and mm -hmm. emotional intelligence and how important it is. Can you just give us your thoughts on as a salesperson, mm -hmm. if you're, if you're, your, your body of, if the tools that you had were a pie, how big a slice do you equate to what we would call EQ or emotional intelligence to your, in your success? I would say that incorporating emotional intelligence and in partnership with that storytelling, which I know is a big emphasis of, of your channel, is really the, the most important way for you to differentiate yourself, for you to build value, for you to be memorable, and for you to tell the advantages of your product. I think this is actually more important than demoing or the actual even product itself because I have seen people with uh, inferior products win business because they had superior sales execution. And the sales execution was usually determined by more compelling storytelling. And there's even been cases where I didn't think that we were the perfect fit. And like functionally, maybe we had gaps that were not as good as our competition. And we won, even though we had bigger gaps because we had a more compelling story and because we understood how to get the customer what they really cared about which is maybe a, a bigger picture goal than the individual features that we were missing. So I think that if you can take, you know, EQ, bundle it up into, a, you know, EQ is kind of like a, a, a thing that you can design and build, but you can't really execute it without storytelling. You take the EQ, you understand what the customer needs, how you can help them, and then you present it in a way they can consume. And that is really how you build the relationship to then ask for the business. Yeah, I mean, EQ has four quadrants, like the, the Gartner, 
quadrant and EQ fits mm -hmm. into a quadrant as well. And there's two quadrants that are really important is self-awareness. This is what I see. And then there's social awareness. And it's that's kind of what you're seeing going on out there and how you react to that and 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 how you interpret the things that you see going on. Um, oftentimes we're in touch with ourselves and in tune and not so much in tune with how we interpret the feelings and how we're making other people feel. And in the moment when we've just given them a demo, how they're reacting to that and feeling, um, because we know that uh, there's two decision trees in every purchase. And that one is the emotional heart and the gut and the other is the logical processing in the head. And it takes both of them before you get a buy. Mm -hmm. And the more you nurture emotional intelligence in your own self, for personal and professional reasons, the better off we are, the more human we are, the better we can in, engage, um, the more we can reach, engage, and convert in our personal and professional lives. And I think to, to, to Kelly's point, I, you know, my platform really is built on storytelling now. I mean, I, I've been in the sales arena for quite a long time. And I know that as I've got more responsibility and I the, 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 the products got more expensive and the products required months and months and months to implement, mm -hmm. you're selling something that's, this is tangible. You can take this pen, you can flick it, you can say, oh, I can feel <laughs> that. You can't feel you know, $1.5 million worth of software. Mm -hmm. It's an idea, right? And in order to get someone to buy that, I like to believe that storytelling is important, but knowing what story they need to hear, or maybe more importantly, being able to tell their story almost as well as they can. Let me see if I understand this correctly. Your infrastructure looks like this, and this is how it works in each line of business. And these people are over here doing really well, but this is the area you want to improve because if you do, they bup, 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 bup. You've told that story about that company almost as well as everybody on that person's team could tell the story. So you're almost one of them at this point. And they get you for free until they pay <laughs> for that software. And so now you position yourself because you did the work to understand their narrative so well that when you told that story, they sit back and they go, that's pretty impressive. I've had moments when I did that same thing over the course of maybe six weeks going to Las Vegas from LA, parachuting into a healthcare organization, drawing on the whiteboard, getting mm -hmm. invited back. They walked me into the, the conference room with the whiteboard. My first panel was still there. After six mm -hmm. weeks, I covered the whole room with stuff, which was me illustrating that I could ask the right questions. I could fill in the blanks with potential solutions. And I could tell them what, what how they would be changed after mm -hmm. they fulfilled everything was on this whiteboard in the sixth meeting, probably the, the most gratifying sell I ever had. I'm at the whiteboard and my analyst is over here and we're doing our usual drill. And the executive, the economic buyer stops me and says, all right, you know, this is the sixth time you've been here and, and uh, we really, really enjoy these sessions. You've proven that you get it, um, but you haven't told us what, you, what we're buying yet. <laughs> And of course, I could have fallen dead off my chair because it was like every salesperson wants to hear that. What am I buying from the mm -hmm. customer? Um, but that was the best sale I ever had. And I think that was for me the, the, the realization that if I did more storytelling, mm -hmm. and all the storytelling in this instance was about what was going on in their world, not mine. Yeah. They said, we don't know what we're buying yet because I hadn't really told them about all the pictures, the pieces mm -hmm. that were my products. They didn't know but what they, they want it. They just knew that they fixed the problem that they had. Mm -hmm. And to Kelly's point, storytelling is powerful because it's memorable. Because anytime the economic buyer wasn't in that room, the picture was on the wall. But more importantly, the story I told about those pictures, somebody could repeat that story. If I had given them a stack of paper and said, here's the bar graphs and charts about what we just talked about, they have to hand it to somebody and hope that they can interpret it. The story mm -hmm. is repeatable and it's memorable. And if it is the right story, it's incisive and insightful. And, um, you know, Plato said 2,500 years ago, 
those that tell the stories rule society. And if you think about that, Plato was knowing then anecdotally how story mm -hmm. works. Now science tells us that a, a great story lights up certain parts of our brain right. and changes the biology. I mean, a, 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 a scary story, cortisol flows through our bloodstream, changing your biology. A story that elicits empathy, oxytocin flows through your bloodstream, again, changing your biology. So if story can change the biology in humans, shouldn't we all be using story in a more compelling way when we're trying to call people to action? There's opportunity there. Kelly is, has, has learned to do that and has trained people how to do that because in, in, social selling is, is kind of storytelling using different platforms to reach people mm -hmm. with the stories that you tell. Um, and I could go on talking to Kelly like this for, for hours. I promised her that we'd go for 30 <laughs> minutes in, and I think we've gone a little over, but Kelly, I so appreciate you for, for making time. Um, there's so much more to talk about. I know we've, we've talked about the bachelorette and the bachelor and I am so much, I feel like I can now be part of the zeitgeist. Are you a fan? You're a fan I now? I'll be a fan. I'll, I'll be in. Is it tonight yeah. that it airs? The, the, the I think first? it's on, I think it's on tomorrow night. Tuesday it's night. on tomorrow night? Mm -hmm. Well, I'll be in front of my TV um, watching and <laughs> I'll be thinking about sales in this conversation as I watch it because um, that rose is metaphor for the win and mm -hmm. the relationships and the way that the winner, in this case, the man navigates it trying to get the bachelorette um, is metaphor for the navigation we have to do when we're trying to win the attention first and, and then win the commitment from the economic buyer and be exactly. the last one standing. Um, so thanks for this post that mm -hmm. is so informative. Thanks for making time today um, to, to chat. I I will send you an invite at your disposal when you have a moment on your calendar. Join me in the Story Cafe where we'll talk about your journey, which I think is uh, going to be a real powerful story because there's this opportunity for people to tune in to learn how you got here and looking over your shoulder, the opportunities and the challenges and the hurdles that you, you, you overcame. Um, Kind of the hero's journey who the mentors were <laughs> who your obi-wan kenobi was <laughs> and, Definitely. and um i'd love to have you do that i, I just want to well, be thanks so much absolutely i, I look forward <laughs> to hearing hearing all about it well um bachelor nation <laughs> i'm now a member thanks to kelly i'm, I'm here thought. for bachelor nation um i hope everybody that's listening live and listening on replay really appreciates um the wisdom of this metaphor, um, the bachelor and bachelorette as metaphor to what it takes to, to, to get, to provide an experience, um, to tell compelling stories, to, to win the heart of the bachelor or bachelorette and to win the business from the customers that we serve. Um, so thanks for tuning in everybody. This is Art Jones at the Art of Standing Out is my business. This show is sales by design. And my, my guest, uh, the best, Kelly Lampkin, thank you so much for, for spending this half hour plus with me today. <laughs> You're so welcome. Thanks for inviting me. I had a great time. Absolutely. Okay. Until next time, everybody. Thanks, Thanks for tuning in.